No. After I left. That's the one, two, three. Hello. <laughs> Louder. <laughs> hey, in the back. Thank you. <laughs> I have to tell you this story. Uh, I wasn't going to, of course, but um, I wrote to a facilitator about a couple months ago, and this woman had taught a course for us. And I said, she, she's not a will member. And she said, uh, I asked her, uh, how did it go? What was your experience? Give me some feedback on, on teaching this course for us. And she said, uh, you know, everything went fine. The people were really wonderful, wonderful group of people. But when I tried to get started, uh, they just wanted to keep talking and talking. <laughs> <laughs> they were having such a good time that uh, I wasn't sure why they were there, you know. <laughs> so of course. And, uh, so I, I kind of felt that a little bit. Um, yeah. I have three announcements. Tomorrow, Thursday, February 9th. Will has three programs. It's very strange. Most days we don't have any. Once in a while we have one. Uh, somehow we have three tomorrow. Starting at 10 o'clock right here in this room, a lecture titled How to Talk to Your Doctor with Nate Fox, a former Silver City kid, now a third year medical student up in uh, Albuquerque talking on that topic. Totally free, open to the whole community. In fact, all three of these uh, talks are open to anyone and they're free. The second one, um, Monique Durham speaking on culture stitch, the culture stitch and also doing a workshop this is at the Silver City Museum um, at the Annex on Broadway at 12 o'clock. And it'll run about two hours, the, the uh, lecture, and then actually doing a workshop and doing some of the stitch. And then at 6.30 tomorrow night at Light Hall, artist Suzanne Donizetti is doing a lecture on her work, which is a copper weaving process. And originally that program was to have a reception that would start at 5.30, but the university canceled that because of uh, weather. The weather might be too good, I don't know. <laughs> Something's wrong. Uh, so it's just the program, it should be excellent, at 6.30 at Light Hall. Um, all of this information is on our website. For more information, go there. And for future programs, go there. Julian. All right, welcome to the third of our six Lunch and Learn presentations for the spring semester. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you that next week, same time, same place, we'll be drawing upon the expertise and uh, knowledge of uh, WNMU faculty once again when uh, professors Jennifer Coleman and Deborah Hiller will give a presentation titled Virtual WNMU and You a lunch and learn about cutting edge online courses offered through WNMU. So I hope to see you all there next week. Uh, our speaker this afternoon, uh, Carmen Vendelin, became the museum director of the Silver City Museum in May of 2016. She has an extensive museum background working at a range of institutions. She moved to New Mexico in 2014 to become curator of art at the New Mexico Museum of Art in Santa Fe. Prior to her arrival in New Mexico, she held a curatorial position.
Chicago and completed doctoral candidacy at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. The title of her remarks today are Not So Easy, Images of Middle Class Men Accosting Unchaperoned Women on the Streets of Paris, 1840-1890. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, great. I'm going to read so I can keep on time, so I'm not going all over the place. So, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to just jump right in. In the second half of the 19th century, prestigious history painting lost its dominance as the most lauded of subject matter at the same time that scenes of banal everyday contemporary life gained popularity with artists and greater acceptance in the art market. In his report on the Paris Art Salon of 1846, Art critic and poet Charles Baudelaire included a polemic defense of the new urban subject matter, which he titled On the Heroism of Modern Life. In this essay, Baudelaire wrote that, quote, the life of our city is rich in poetic and marvelous subjects. We are enveloped and steeped as though in an atmosphere of the marvelous, but we do not notice it. Unquote. In the years that followed, impressionist, post-impressionist, and even some academic artists explored urban themes. Young working women in particular became modern subjects. In 1859, uh, Jules Michelet asserted that a woman could not venture out alone, particularly at night, but everywhere artists show us just such scenarios. Michelet claims that the lone woman would constitute a spectacle. The term spectacle is apropos given the number of artist depictions of unchaperoned women and the attention they received. Okay. Along with shop girls, laundresses held a special place in the bourgeois imagination. Both professions were favorite subjects for artists depicting scenes of modern Parisian life. Women in both fields could be seen in public spaces in the commission of their daily work. Artists usually chose to depict these women as young, pretty, and coquettish. Laundresses hauled clothing and linens in bundles and baskets down to the banks of the Seine River for laundering. In Henri Boutet's color lithograph, the setting is an authentic rendering of the location where laundresses brought laundry. However, the young woman is smartly dressed and she defies credulity as she carries the heavy <laughs> basket effortlessly. Working women more commonly wore unstructured garments that allowed greater freedom of movement. Uh, Tanfield Steinland's laundresses, while very well put together here, wear slightly more authentic looking clothes. But again, they carry their baskets as if they're empty props. Now, the artist Pierre Bonnard, while more concerned with form, shows us a woman who's arguably leaning a bit more to support the weight of a basket that's nearly as large as herself, while managing to hold an umbrella in the other hand. She also seems too well dressed to be out doing laundry with her nice coat, hat, and umbrella. In comparison, Henri de Toulouse Lautrec depicts artist Suzanne Valadon in typical laundress attire in his 1889 painting. Notice the loose fitting top and the lack of corseting. This is more what an actual laundress would wear. Another design by Steinlin shows a female figure who does contort her body to support the weight of the laundry she much more realistically carries. A group of men ogle her from the back of a passing omnibus. She's clearly eye candy young, attractive, alone, and on display while in the commission of her work. The text of the poem that accompanies the image states that she looks like a monkey because of the posture she must take on to carry the heavy basket. That she's compared to a monkey suggests there's something bestial about her. Even though she's clearly attractive to the men on the omnibus, the comparison is not flattering. It reinforces the judgment that she is inferior because of her class status. Furthermore, in the context of the 19th century, the supposedly more animal-like nature of working-class women goes along with a more libidinal temperament. If middle-class women were supposed to be sexless domestic angels, working-class women in the bourgeois imagination were highly sexed and responsible for arousing men's desires. So contrast all these depictions with Henri Daumier's laundress who strains and contorts her body to accommodate the heavy linens she carries in, bun in burden. This was grueling manual labor. The profession attracted single mothers who could bring their children 
along as they worked, which of course added to the perception that these were women of, you know, easy virtue. Delamie depicts his laundress accompanied by her child to emphasize their economic plight, not her sexual behavior. Edgar Degas similarly portrays the physical toil of, of laundresses of ironing. He and Domier both attire the women in sensible, loose-fitting clothes suitable to the work they performed. Retail sales jobs and millinery work were glamorous by comparison. tell which was is the general adjective for men, which was for women. Um, like their counterpart male clerks, they muddied the demarcation of class boundaries in their mode of dress. As working class women, they had both the freedom and necessity to venture into public spaces without male escort. They were not protected hothouse flowers in leisure class. They had to go to and from jobs. They made deliveries during working hours as so many artists' canvases attest. I'm using several terms that were used almost interchangeably to describe these young women who worked in the fashion industry. So you've got a midnet, which is a shop girl, Trotan, which is a errand girl, modiste, who is a maker or seller of fashionable dresses and hats. And they're kind of, you know, like I said, the terms were used fairly interchangeably in the era. Um, this is Stalin's illustration of a story called Le Trotan. So again, that's an errand girl. It also became Argo, which is also French for slang, uh, for a milliner's assistant who's also a part-time unregistered prostitute. So that's how it would have been read in the era. Although the artist himself does not play it up, the nickname implies that these young women are on the street attempting to solicit wealthy men to augment their wages from their jobs. Jean Barreau depicts a shop girl handing a package to an elegantly dressed woman as she climbs into her handsome cab. Upper class women did not walk through the streets carrying packages. They would either take their purchases with them in their carriages or have the goods delivered. So all of those modistes in the paintings and prints are errand girls delivering packages to wealthy customers. You'll notice that the, um, the midnight here, uh, wears a nice tailored outfit, but that it's rather plain in comparison to that of the shopper that she's handing the package to. In there is um, Promenade of Paris, the young women are without packages, but they can still be identified as shop girls because of the simplicity and tailoring of their black dresses. Steinlin offers us a trotin as something of a flaneuse or female flaneur in this 1897 image on the cover of the illustrated journal at Gilles de la. The Flaneur uh, was a man of leisure who spent his day strolling the streets of Paris and botanizing the so sidewalk, as Baudelaire put it. Baudelaire also saw this as the role of the artist who depicted modern life. He advocated that these artists become Flaneurs themselves to better immerse themselves in the experience of their environment. The Flaneur maintained a privileged position in relationship takes it on her eyes. She enjoys idling along and taking in the visual landscape. She's made the world her spectacle and is engaged in the very modern activity of looking at advertising posters. More often, the young women were the objects of looking. James Tissot's painting takes us inside a milliner's shop. The shop girl holds open the door as um, 
and is there to serve us, the viewers, who are in the physical space of the customer who she addresses with her gaze. She's looking directly at us. Her pleasant, inviting demeanor suggests that she addresses a heterosexual male viewer. However, one would assume that customers to the store would be primarily female. Are we then in the place of a female customer about to take our packages and walk out the door onto the street? Could a customer be a man uh, shopping for his wife or mistress? It's not clear. To the left, another shop girl glances out at a customer who stares at her through the window. So that's, oops, sorry. Um, this interaction right here. He's window shopping and she's on display along with the merchandise. <laughs> the young woman on the other side of the glass appears to be unaccompanied. She's possibly attracted the attention of another man who salutes as she passes by. So this is her and here he is. In the night, this is great painting. <laughs> In the 19th century, the economy of France shifted from being largely agrarian to industrial and urban. Young people from the rural provinces streamed into Paris looking for work. Single women came to work in factories and as domestics. However, factory jobs for women became scarce in the second half of the 19th century because there were enough men to fill the available jobs and men were given preference. Some women found work as laundresses and modistes as an alternative. All struggled to live apart from their families on low wages in the big city with almost no support system. Such is the circumstance of the heroine Denise in Emile Zola's novel, The Lady's Paradise, which is set in the world of a Parisian department store. The first department store was established in Paris in 1852 and thereafter competed with specialty stores and changed the rules of selling to customers by offering the enticement of bargain bins and advertised sales. In The Lady's Paradise, Denise, a 20-year-old orphan with two younger brothers to look after, struggles to survive and is advised to find a man to keep her. The argument is made that it is impossible for a woman to support herself on what little she can earn. Denise, however, resists the pressure to become a mistress and struggles through on her own. Although Denise works in women's wear department in the novel, in actuality, very few women worked in the department stores. A woman employed in the millinery trades was much more likely to work in a small shop, we see here, or in her own lodgings, um, getting paid to do piecework. Changes in social custom and interaction brought about by the Industrial Revolution and increasing urbanism complicated the social order of post-revolutionary France and the ability of the individual to make cursory judgments about people based on physical appearance. Dress had traditionally imparted instant and important information about one's status and identity. In 19th century Paris, urban population density assured that people dealt with strangers on a regular basis. Being able to read a person by appearance alone became of anything more important. After the sumptuary laws which had regulated what members of a particular class could wear were repealed in 1793, dress became less immediately, class became less immediately recognizable. Although subtle details of cut and ornament still served the function of defining differences in class, age, profession, etc. The retail salesperson constituted a particularly troubling figure because dressing in bourgeoisie fashion was frequently part of the job. The sales clerks often served as living mannequins for the wares they sold and dressed in a manner that made them seem less like members of the so-called popular classes and more palatable to their customers. And yet, as soon as they left their posts, they could no longer be as easily distinguished from those who they served, hence the, threat, the threat. Body language conveyed information about a wearer's station in life in this regard. Maurice Delcourt's modiste dressed in the height of fashion, but even without the hat boxes, their comportment would give them away. As they pass each other, each turns to look at the other. They both draw back slightly in a gesture that suggests a negative judgment about the other's appearance. <laughs> this sort of open cattiness demonstrates that they have not had years of grooming to teach them how to maintain a neutral air and posture while thinking such thoughts. The bent posture and facial expressions, which are more evident the figure turned toward us, reveal her to be clearly not a member of the bourgeoisie. In the 19th century, there was a double standard in place that limited the movement and independence of women. By convention, the public sphere was the domain of men and the domestic the domain of women. The very terms public woman and streetwalker mean prostitute. 
This slang reveals the degree to which the presence of an unescorted woman in the public streets was considered an unacceptable moral transgression. For middle class women, trips beyond the home required the supervision of either an older female uh, or male relatives throughout most of the century. Even then, middle class women could only go to places deemed appropriate, like, for example, the department store and the opera. And here we see a properly chaperoned uh, woman, presumably with an older relative, walking by the ruins of the Tuileries Palace. In his 1859 book, La Femme, The Woman, Jules Michelet wrote that following um, the following to describe the consequences that women would face if they ventured out unescorted. How many irritations for the single woman? She can hardly go out in the evening. She would be taken for a prostitute. There are a thousand places only men are to be seen, and if she needs to go there on business, the men are amazed and laugh like fools. Should she find herself at the other end of Paris and hungry, she will not dare to enter a restaurant. She would constitute an event. She would be a, a spectacle. Mm -hmm. Edward Manet's painting seems to illustrate the very danger Michelet writes of. An overly fresh young man has installed himself at the table of the lone female diner. He crouches beside her, one far too casual arm around the back of her chair. With his other hand, he strokes her wine glass. Her stiff posture suggests that she is middle class, although the fact that she is alone makes her class status and sexual virtue questionable. The man who feels that he can take full advantage of the situation is not a bourgeois, that is not upper class. Um, the male model is actually the son of the restaurant owner, and the woman is modeled by a relative of composer Jacques Offenbach. Uh, it is a truly unusual scene depicting a man attempting to seduce a woman of higher station. In other circumstances, this man would not assume that he could approach this woman in this manner if she were properly chaperoned or even if there were other bourgeois present. He would be compelled to maintain rules of decorum. With only the bemused waiter looking on, this young man presses his luck. The leader there with <laughs> kind of curious expression. In the inverse of this painting, however, it was rather um, I'm going to that one yet. In the inverse of this painting, however, it was rather common for upper class men to pursue women of the so-called popular classes. Even though Michelet uses woman as a general term in La Femme. He really means middle class women. There was uh, actually, in actuality, a wide disparity in how the state of affairs he described affected working class women in comparison to their middle class counterparts. Most notably, working class women were much more likely to find themselves both unescorted and taken for prostitutes. Moreover, though, women of all classes were increasingly out in public and unaccompanied towards the end of the century, spectacle or not. Cultural anxieties persisted, and this new development made the whole endeavor of trying to read a woman's virtue through her behavior even more difficult and problematic. Michelet's statement of 1859 continued to represent a conservative attitude that would be challenged as even proper bourgeois took up bicycling, shopped alone in department stores, and rode in carriages unchaperoned. Here we see an elegant woman unaccompanied. Um, Jean Moreau, the painter's style, was fairly academic, but he also had a great sense of humor. And this is one of several carriage alighting or uh, dismounting scenes that feature a group of beggars waiting and hoping that the wealthy passenger will give them a handout. At the end of the century, Nabi artists show us women out in force. In Valentin's 1895 street corner, he depicts not only the ubiquitous modiste with her hat box, but also several smartly dressed women out on their own. Women dominate in Bonnard's 1899 rendition of the theme. Again, we have a modiste, but also we have either a, um, a nanny or possibly even a young mother um, with children, an older woman alone. This figure right here. This is the modiste again. Um, and two women who stop to chat with each other on the street. So here we have a public space that's truly female friendly. Even if these are but scenes imagined by the artist, they do reflect the growing presence of women in the public sphere. In contrast, scenes of the so-called raffle also appear at the end of the century. 
The rabble was a roundup of women caught out alone. The gendarme or police conducted these raids in an effort to curb clandestine guilt or innocence. In Steinlund's 1891 illustration for a story called The Raffle, the scene is chaotic as women attempt to flee. In this earlier work, Steinlund also shows a variety of costumes and types of women to illustrate the fact that women were incarcerated, incarcerated indiscriminately. In effect, women could be arrested just for being out on their own after working hours. In the eyes of many middle-class women, men, Working women were sexually available. They were paid for their labor. Perhaps they could be paid for sexual favors as well, and many could. Some bourgeois would believe that women alone in public on, out in the commission of their jobs uh, were of loose morals because they were unchaperoned, and these men were coming from a socioeconomic context in which proper young women were shepherded and inaccessible. Um, others may not have assumed as much about a woman's character, but simply taken advantage of the fact that the young woman had no protector to stop him from uh, in his attempted seduction. So in the paintings as well as prints, more often than not, the young women appear coquettish and even seductive. And we'll look at Perez Parisian again. And the term Parisian um, was applied to the most stylish women of the city, so it's interesting that Perez shows us a motif instead of a bourgeois or even a demi-mondaine. Gustave Caillebotte's painting, Pont de l'Europe, has been a subject of scholarly debate because the relationship between the two well-dressed cent uh, central figures is unclear. If the couple was together, the man would not be walking in front of the woman as that would be rude. If she is instead unaccompanied, which seems more likely from their placement, the man is instead turning back to look her over and to attempt to speak with her. Much like the man in the man they painting, this man assumes he can take liberties in addressing this woman because she is without a protector. In Barreau's painting, Rue Royale, a bourgeois and a trotten make eye contact. And I don't know if it's big enough for you to see that there's, she's looking right at him, he's looking over. Um, she turns back towards him. His body posture suggests something like surprise. Didn't it, you know. The boldness of her gesture out in public thoroughfare marks her as a woman out to pick up a man for his money. Journal illustrator illustrations show what the paintings more often only imply is a possibility. One recurring theme in 19th century journal illustration is that of a middle class man attempting to accost the lone young woman. In this illustration by Steinlund, for example, we see a bourgeois pursuing a young delivery woman carrying a package. She encourages him by looking back in his direction as he struggles to keep up with her. In this humorous cartoon strip from the journal Le Chat Noir, a bourgeois gentleman offers to hold package for a, young, uh, for a young woman and hands her his umbrella. She walks away with his umbrella and without her packages, uh, as he's distracted by a laborer who knocks off the man's hat with a beam. When the gentleman gets home, he opens one of the boxes and discovers a baby hidden inside. The theme of chivalry in extending the umbrella is common in uh, these narrative cartoons. You can see him with the baby there. The subject of men accosting unaccompanied women on the street derives from Gavarni's Laurettes of the 1840s. In Play 21 from Gavarni's series, for example, a man follows after a veiled woman aggressively leaning towards her, offering her a ticket to a ball as a remuneration for a kiss. The Laurettes were mistresses and dressed in fashionable clothing paid for by the bourgeois men who kept them. The Lorettes dressed like upper class women but were not accepted in the company of bourgeois women because of their working class origins and socially ostracized status as courtesans. Employing the French proverb about selling, saddling for blackbirds when one cannot get a thrush, look to grieve, uh, Le Chat Noir journal artist depicted bourgeois men approaching unaccompanied women in hopes that one will turn out to be a prostitute. 
So in Faute de Grieve by Belon, we see a middle class man following a modiste carrying a hat box. She starts up the stairs toward Montmartre. The man stops and wipes his head with a handkerchief and a gesture that suggests the effort of walking up the stairs is more than he's willing to take on. Then he decides instead to approach an older woman and identifiably working class garb. She's wearing an open jacket that's not fitted and she's not wearing a hat. Who he, he deems that she's going to be an easier mark and she doesn't even walk off with him. In Enlique, this is 1892 take on the proverb, a man follows two uninterested working class women before he succeeds with the third. Occasionally, journal illustrators condemn the men and depict the women's experience as that of being harassed rather than encouragingly flirtatious. This is especially true of the cartoons published in the artistic cabaret journal Le Chat Noir. Rather than succeeding in the pursuit of young women, the man is more often courted and humiliated in some way. In Nini Incorruptible, a flirtatious looking modiste carrying a hat box is pursued by a dirty old man type. She thumps her nose at him in the second cell of the series. It's quite hard with this being a small business. Um, he pursues her with his umbrella, again, as it starts to rain. And the umbrella is employed as a pretext for approaching the young woman. He reaches out to cover her with the umbrella. She picks up her pace undoubtedly to escape him. She ultimately ducks into shelter and puts her hand out as if to stop him. He comes to a halt. He looks defeated, sinking back into his legs and allowing the umbrella to drop. <laughs> so the Freudian phallic symbolism of the upright umbrella that falls helps to demonstrate that the male figure has failed in his attempt at sexual conquest. Although modistes were typically depicted as coquettish, a portrayal of a coy woman such as this is actually uh, uh, rare in the illustrations of Le Chat Noir. Uh, in this image, the female figure lifts her skirt in the rain uh, while running away. Uh, women were frequently depicted lifting their skirts to avoid puddles. It gave the artist an excuse to show petticoats. Okay, it's got to be before. No, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the mundane or society woman right there. Um, so she's here with the others to de demonstrate that even proper ladies can try ways to show petticoats and leg. Uh, we can tell she's not a demi-mundane um, because of the simplicity of her jewelry. Demi-mundanes were very fashionable but not properly bourgeois. They were uh, kept women kept in lavish style, they're often uh, actresses, they often had a level of celebrity status, and they would wear more flamboyant jewelry uh, and ornamentation. So this female figure's uh, decolletage and bare arms are proper in this context because we're seeing her dressed in an evening gown. She'd be covered up uh, during the day. She looks her dress to curtsy as if she's being introduced to someone at a fancy dress ball. The next figure is a trotin. Erin Girl, uh, similar to the Lorette in that she is fashionably dressed in clothes most probably purchased or afforded by her bourgeois lovers. She holds up her skirts to attract potential sugar daddies while contemplating a puddle to make it look like a practical gesture. And then you'll notice next to her is the modiste who has her skirt held behind her, which seems like a practical way to go. Um, her placement among these other types, specifically between a trotan and a body dancer, shows the degree to which shop girls were considered to be potential or actual part-time prostitutes. The Moulin Rouge dancer kicks up her leg for a can-can. This is, of course, not proper according to middle-class rules of decorum. And the last woman is a hardened street prostitute. Over, sorry, she's a young. <coughs> there and um, 
she's you know she's not paid enough to afford fancy clothes and she doesn't even try to pull off coquettish all pretense out there okay in this next illustration by Steinlin uh, for a song about trotans we see the same affectation by his trotans pulling up their skirt to un, uh, unnecessarily so they can attract male attention so notice the hat box notice also that the woman with the hat box is being prepositioned is being propositioned um, left of center, let's see if I see it, uh, all the way back here. Um, being uh, propositioned in the midground of the composition. This is the iconography that Nini uh, in Coratibla plays off of. So if we go to that one again, in Nini in Coratibla, the conventional beauty and coded flirtatiousness of the figure's facial expression, which is pleasant, slightly smiling, placid, subverts the genre. Her skirt is much shorter than contemporary convention. Her posture is sexually provocative. She mockingly thrusts out her derriere out as she, um, as she thumps her nose at the man. Even though she looks inviting, she thwarts the bourgeois male seeking her attention. The title plainly states that she is incorruptible, and here that means sexually incorruptible. In the context of Le Chat Noir, this is a statement against the capitalist social economics of bourgeois men and the working class women who are willing to date them for monetary benefits. Um, this depiction, moreover, throws into question the availability and possible agency of all unaccompanied working class female figures depicted as similarly flirtatious and sexually inviting in contemporary street scenes. In other words, um, a composition such as this demonstrates that not all attractive coquettish women were possibly waiting to be picked up and that some are quite willing and able to reject their potential suitors. In Jibori, which means sudden shower, a well-dressed man again does the gentlemanly action of coming to the rescue of the errand girl caught in the rain. Her attitude towards the man is ambivalent. She seems comfortable enough to walk with him, but when his umbrella is blown back by a wind, she takes the opportunity to make a break for it. She dashes away and he slips and falls running after her. She seems surprised and not happy to see him when he catches up to her in the last vignette. You see her kind of oh dear hands there. Um, her surprise can be partly due, due to his mud appearance, but the fact that she ran suggests that she was not altogether interested in spending more time with him. In the misadventures of Monsieur Sardou, a British tourist is checking out his map. He's checking out his map, and he's approached by a robotic doll of a woman who proceeds to torment him flirtatiously, even kicking out his hat at one point. In the end, she has his money, which she flashes in both hands, and he walks away with a rabbit on a leash. The rabbit traditionally symbolizes sexuality and fertility. Here, it suggests that this man has been taken financially because of his lust. The expressionless female figure is more automaton than human and goes through the motions of playing with the man's intentions to obtain her cash reward. This illustration confirms the mercenary intentions of the young woman and her lack of any sincere interest in the man. Her blankness makes an interesting contrast to depictions of more devious seductresses. In Unconquête, which means a conquest, the hapless bois is subject to even more embarrassment. He reaches out with one finger to touch the calf of an unaccompanied young woman whose upper body is obscured by an umbrella. Uh, she turns and reveals herself to be a priest. <laughs> so again, there is this predatory sense that unaccompanied women are seen as sexually available and fair game by bourgeois men. In this case, the artist has played on mistaken identity and gender. This kind of gender confusion joke was, particular, was particularly popular in Bohemia Montmartre and fit in with the Rabelaisian coffee turvy Convention of gender instability. Um, the most extreme instance of the tables being turned is in this uh, image of feminine vengeance by Falco. In this in illustration, a well dressed man approaches a well dressed woman who welcomes his advances. In this case, however, it, the individuals uh, both seem to be of the same class. However, she quickly turns the tables on him and faces, forces him to disrobe at gunpoint. In the final scene, he's led away by the news of gendarme, his head bowed in shame, and his top hat covering his genitals. That was for him. So again, a Chat Noir artist employs this gambit of flipping the expectation. 
They love that kind of topsy-turvy move. So this woman is not the passive 19th century flower. Her apparel seems very popular, uh, properly bourgeois. Nothing in her appearance marks her as working class or a demi-mondaine or even a femme nouvelle, which was a you know, French new woman that would have coded her as a feminist. Um, you know, even though she's on chaperone, again, she looks, you know, probably middle class. There's something particularly modern about the whole concept of this cartoon strip. The female figure takes very uncharacteristically unfeminine action. She employs the threat of violence. This coaster is masculine. She's confident in holding out the gun rather than uh, being timid or unsure. She shows no embarrassment in the face of the male nudity that she's demanded. The man is effectively emasculated in the loss of his status confer conferring garments. He is powerless and feminized. She obviously planned this. She tricked this man. Here's what you know. She, we can assume she just believes should happen to men who accost women on the street. It's, um, you know, like I said, very unusual, this extreme uh, vigilante justice. And it's at odds with mainstream French attitudes of the time towards seduction. Uh, so keep in mind that seduction was generally accepted as a typical masculine behavior encouraged by the desirability of women. In other words, women were held responsible for her inflating men's passions. Um, here the woman takes masculine authority and dictates the terms of engagement. Another from uh, Chat Noir Journal, the triumph the poet, um, too mature, rotund. being done by these, you know, these bohemian artists, because <laughs> this is their worldview. Um, so we have that here. The bohemians are the creative class. The bourgeois are seen as the predatory capitalists. Their wealth and greed is displayed corporeal and large bellies, which signify material gluttony. And in contrast, the young circus performer, despite her class at, um, status and risque costume, is a honest woman in choosing love over money. So if we go back now again to the Gavarni illustrations from the 1840s, I want to suggest that it can really be read two ways. Without the placement of this work as a depiction of a Lorette, it appears to be an image of a woman being harassed. She is veiled, which gives her a layer of separation from the world around her. Her stride is determined and swift. She's not idling by. She's walking at a brisk pace with her face closed off as if she's in a hurry and intending to avoid being accosted as she makes her way to her destination. She does not stop or turn to acknowledge the man who approaches her and leans towards her. It's only her designation as a Lorette in the series that suggests her affections are in fact negotiable. It could be that this young woman is well cared for by another man and is uninterested in this man's weak offer. However, it's interesting to consider what it means if this is in actuality meant to depict an uninterested woman trying to avoid male attention as she makes her way along the Paris street alone. Paul Giovanni was a sophisticated and cynical social observer, and it's completely possible that he intentionally implies a nuanced critique within the composition. Similarly, the lone working class woman in Steinlin's 1899 Gilles Blanc cover illustration for Le Dons by Maurice de Marsan uh, walks steadfastly forward. Her body strains forward as if she might reach her destination faster that way. She efficiently holds her skirt so as not to be bothered with occasional hazards. The position of her body, leading with her head and back bent, and the placement of her hand in relationship to her lower back, even suggests that she might be tired and have a backache. 
She may be le leaning to relieve the pressure on her back after a day of work. She may be trying to get to the, through the obstacle course of men in the city as fast as she can. Notice her sensible shoes and the difference between her and the smiling women we saw in Jean Barreau's paintings. Again, the artist may intend that we read the image this way while context suggests something else. In the story of Le the gentleman and the working woman end up in a, a romantic relationship. What we see in the illustration is the moment when he first sees and approaches to introduce himself. Now, would you guess that this was a depiction of their first romantic meeting without knowing the plot? <laughs> That's not really what it looks like. <laughs> there can be no argument that many winning women, the, many working class women enjoyed being picked up by middle class men and that many single working women engaged in part time prostitution to supplement their major, meager wages. However, this was not the case for all working women. These images of women seeming less than thrilled at the attention they received reflect a context where certain things were assumed. It was assumed that working women might be sexually interested, and it was assumed by bourgeois men that they could approach these women and attempt to seduce them as part of their upper class male privilege. I showed you several images in which women actively reject male suitors. I've also suggested that other images can be read as coded depictions of harassment. In journal illustrations especially, you can see the contemporary issues that people were wrestling with. Gender roles were changing. More women worked outside the home. Women were demonstrably more visible in public spaces towards the end of the 19th century. These continued to be spaces where men could easily approach unchaperoned women. The journals show us images of both of women luring and rejecting male advances. The compositions demonstrate that the increasing female agency in matters of sexual choice and reflect contemporary challenges to the concept of the sexless bourgeois lady and indiscriminately libidinal working classes. Instead of remaining mere objects of desire, the female figures in these illustrations asserted themselves. Thank you. I was kind of curious about the uh, the social um, and commercial um, um, position of the flaneur. Uh, uh, when you read Henry, Henry James, for example, the flaneur is, is not considered a, an appropriate social position. Um, mm -hmm. So one would wonder just whether these are, are successful bourgeois guys lounging oh, around on the trottoir yeah. of uh -huh. Paris, or if these are kind of, um, how shall we say, less than successful um, <laughs> um, layabouts. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, and I'm sure there was a range, you know, and certainly there's other images I didn't show, like of, of um, middle class men with working class women in bars, for example. So a lot of people did that after work, you know, it was like a meeting space. So there was certainly that. But yeah, I'm sure there were also men who went straight home to their families. So. But I was just wondering about mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, perhaps there was a social. Um, yeah. Class expressed on the on the trottoir of uh, Paris, mm -hmm. having to do with uh, maybe upper class guys wouldn't uh, wouldn't well, deign to be. I can't think of the word now. There's a, another word for working class guys who were lay, you know, hanging out, and checking things out on the street. Flaneur was usually reserved for a more upper class status man who had the leisure to walk around, because there's there are some texts that get into that difference. Mm -hmm on how it's you know, very much has to do with class, whether it's you being a lazy working class person or whether it's a gentleman taking a stroll. Right. Know. So in a James novel, for example, you wouldn't find these guys in, who are expressive, expressive of kind of middle class or upper middle class mm -hmm. um, English types yeah. mm -hmm. um, lounging around on the sidewalks, right? 
Um, so yeah, well, France was very different than England in, in you know, of course, a number of ways. But one, there was a lot more. Um, an ownership stake. Frank? So, what's the storyline of how um, this topic caught your interest and where you did your research? Yeah, it's related to my dissertation that I didn't finish. Yeah. So um, for my, my written exam when I was qualifying, I did a paper on the um, the gesture of lifting the skirt. And my dissertation is actually on bohemian self-fashioning in the cabaret journal Chat Noir and in, um, uh, well, I'm blanking on the name of my other journal right now, but another um, Courrier Francais, which was more of a commercial enterprise that was, it was a journal that was marketed to the middle class so that they would know what was going on in the artistic cabaret so that you come in and slum it in Montmartre that was the fun thing to do. Um, and then these artistic cabarets, you know, it was kind of a collaborative effort by writers and artists, you know, to put on uh, shadow theater and put out the journals. And I was specifically looking at the way that Bohemians um, show themselves as being different from both the working class and the middle class. So it's really about gender identity and class. And this is a lot of the same material, and that's how it's related. It's also related to a class that I um, used to teach about artists in Paris in the second half of the 19th century. So looking at all those impressionist and post-impressionist artists, where they're depicting their friends and the bars and the streets of Paris, where it's very local and very much about the lives that they're leading. Uh, could you generalize uh, to what extent, or tell us what? To what extent do you think your, the conclusions that you draw from the French situation can be generalized to the other great cities of Europe of that time? Well, the French were, you know, I, they really didn't see anything wrong with seduction, especially men. You know, it was really considered, you know, fine. I think that the British were a little more uptight about it, a little more worried about the plight. Especially women who were in their own spaces doing piece work. You see artists, Victorian artists doing paintings of that, being very concerned about the plight of those young women. You don't get that in France. They're not really worried about those young women. Women, they're not worried about them getting seduced. Like that's really not considered a problem. And um, another thing in in France, they didn't want to go after men for child support because they thought that would discourage people from having children. So there was a really different. Um, you know, some really different ideas about sexuality, I think, from a lot of other places in Europe. Mm -hmm. so, and, you know, uh, feminism in France has been different as well, because, you know, uh, many of you might know in France, gender roles are pretty well defined, and flirting is still today, it's considered a very normal part of, you know, the way men and women talk to each other. And so feminism played out a little bit differently there than the, in Britain and the U.S., just in part because, um, most French women were not really rejecting femininity in that role, you know. So it was, it's just, you know, it's, it's different in the cultural context. You were mentioning lifting the skirt, so uh -huh. the motif, yes, uh, perhaps flirtation or momentary <laughs> need to get one's dress out. Of money. Yes, but there's also I don't know if you call it a trope, but there's a symbolism. Mm -hmm. of the bending at the hip, which is, I think, rather unnatural. Now, maybe uh -huh. that was a social thing at the time. Of course, it's every class did. Uh -huh. But the pointing of a foot, a tug, uh -huh. right uh -huh. in this business here with uh -huh. your arms somewhere. But this is extremely bad posture. <laughs> <laughs> right, but the, you is know. Is this meaning flirtation, or is this meaning the way women deferred from any class level? Remember that they wore corsets, that they couldn't bend at the waist. I see. 
Yeah, really explain no, that's really bad. <laughs> 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 so, so, several pictures. Mm -hmm. So it was like a motif of we're telling you something with this. Uh -huh. Now, but lower class women were wearing corsets. They had the flexibility to the looser clothes. Mm -hmm. So we're always seeing the working class and then up above mm -hmm. rather than the laundry class. I mean, the work clerk girl. Right? Yeah, and I can't think of any image depicting a long dress curtsy. Probably wouldn't see that. You'd see a little more of that with, you know, like your shop girls, and they were probably mimicking the upper class to the ability that they could. No more questions? I have a question. Yeah. It's a bit unrelated, but you, you mentioned mm -hmm. at one point that prostitution was legal during mm -hmm. this time period. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it sounds like the government had some control. Oh, yes. So they, they had weekly um, gynecological checks physical checks, they would be lined up in a brothel and have to pull up their skirt and get checked. It was really humiliating and awful, and that's why those who didn't want to register, you know, did it under the official sign. It, it sounds like that's a way for kind of the uh, patriarchal society to control women's sexuality. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. my question is, with the, the feminist movement that mm -hmm. was around at this time, what was their stance on prostitution in that mm -hmm. sense? I don't know if I read that. You know, I, I don't, I don't know how concerned they really were about that. There were some books that were written by men, like there's a real famous one in the 1830s that basically um, describes prostitutes as being like a cesspool, a sewer. They were seen as a necessary evil. I don't think that a lot of the upper class women involved in feminism identified with those the women who were prostitutes. I don't think they thought about them that much. There was more of that, again, in Victorian Britain. You saw paintings that were concerned with, you know, so-called fallen women, with women who come to the city by themselves, away from their family, gotten a job, couldn't make ends meet, ended up in prostitution, and there was actually concern for them there. You don't see that nearly so often in France. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much, Carmen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, illustrated week.